such an important event. Uh, we would like to begin by acknowledging that we are Mi'kmaq Eid, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Next week, our panel discussion is entitled Resilience or Reluctance, Climate Change Adaptation Policy in Atlantic Canada. It will feature Omer Shwina, Blair Philomate, Megan Leslie, Kate Sharon, and Rob Strang. I'm sure it's gonna be an outstanding discussion about climate change uh, adaptation policy, and we encourage you all to join us next week. We wanna thank everybody for coming. We also wanna thank our live stream audience that are attending uh, through technology. Um, it's uh, my pleasure now to introduce Elder Jerry Muska LeBlanc for our, our opening reflection. Jerry. Good morning. <laughs> Can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? So I'd like to say a prayer um, to open up the conference. Creator Gizok, thank you for today's sunrise, for the breath and life within us, and for all of your creations. Creator, we ask that you hear our prayer. As the day begins with the rising sun, we ask Spirit of the East, Brother Eagle, to be with us. Fly as high as you can carry my prayers to the Creator. May I have an eye as sharp as yours so I am able to see the truth and hope on the path I have chosen. Guide my step and give me courage and walk the circle of life with honesty and dignity. Spirit Keeper of the South, Wolf, be with us. Help us to remember to love and feel compassion for all mankind. Help us to walk the path and joy with joy and love for ourselves, for others, for the four-legged, the winged ones, the plants, and all creation upon Mother Earth. Show us it is right for us to, take, to make decisions with our hearts, even if at times our hearts become hurt. Help us to grow and nurture ourselves worth, our self-worth in all ways. Spirit Keeper of the West, Brown Bear, be with me. Bring healing to the people I love and to myself. Bring into balance the physical, mental, and spiritual so I'm able to know my place on earth, in life and in death. Heal my body, heal my mind, and bring light, joy, and awareness to my spirit. Spirit Keeper of the North, White Buffalo, be with us. As each day passes, help us to surrender with grace the things of our youth. Help us to listen to the quiet and find serenity and comfort in the silences as they become longer. Give us wisdom so we are able to make wise choices in all things, which are put in front of us. And when time for the change of worlds has come, let us go peacefully without regrets for the things we've neglected to do as we walked along our paths. Mother Earth, thank you for your beauty and for all you have given us. Remind us never to take more from you than we need and to remind us to always give back more than I can take. All my relations, Tahoe. I have something else I'd like to share with you. You can have a seat, please. <laughs> I'd like to, something else that I found online last night that I want to share with you, and it's so, so simple, but it means so much. And it's called Six Little Stories with Lots of Meanings. Once all villagers decided to pray for rain. On the day of prayer, all the people gathered, but only one boy came with an umbrella. That's faith. When you throw babies in the air, they laugh because they know you will catch them. That's trust. Every night we go to bed without any assurance of being alive the next morning, but we still set the alarms to wake us up. That's hope. Mm -hmm. We plan big things for tomorrow in spite of zero knowledge of the future. That's confidence. We see the world suffering, but still we get married and have children. That is love. Mm -hmm. An old man's shirt was written on an old man's shirt was written a sentence, I am not 80 years old. I am sweet 16 with 64 years of experience. <laughs> that's attitude, and that's my attitude. <laughs> Have a happy day and live your life like these um, six stories. Remember, good friends are rare jewels of life, difficult to find and impossible to replace. Enjoy the conference. Thank you, Jerry. Um, I was indeed lucky to uh, connect with uh, Naomi Metallic in organizing today's panel, and a lot of the credit goes to her, so I want to thank her for her assistance in, in putting panel, today's panel together. Um, 
Naomi will also do double duty today and chair as well as present, so we're grateful for that also. Uh, Naomi Metallic is from the Listagug Mi'kmaq First Nation. Pretty good. Pretty, okay, thank you. Listagug. Listagug. She holds a BA from Dalhousie, an LLB from Dalhousie, and an LLL from Ottawa, and an LLM from Osgood. Naomi uh, still continues to practice law with Birchall's LLP in Halifax. She's been named to the best lawyer in Canada list in Aboriginal law since 2015 and was chosen for Canadian Lawyers Magazine 2018 Top 25 Most Influential Lawyers in the Area of Human Rights, Advocacy, and Criminal Law. As a legal scholar, she's particularly interested in writing about how the law can be harnessed to promote the well-being and self-determination of Indigenous peoples in Canada. Please join me in welcoming Naomi Metallic. I'm just trying to get the PowerPoint. Per oh, it's right there. Brilliant. It's like they arranged it that way. Gwe ni deluzi Naomi Metali deliwit listiguch ak wildasi begisin giskuk. I am learning my language and just a little introduction of myself and also saying that I'm very happy to be here. Um, so I'm going to, um, as, um, as was said, Kevin said, I'm doing double duty. I will introduce Angelina and Cindy. Uh, momentarily after I'm done my presentation uh, as they go up. Um, I'm so pleased to be on this panel with them. Uh, they're amazing people doing great work. Also, thank you so much for your opening prayer, Jerry. That was uh, excellent. So um, I know we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to jump right into it. Um, so talking about child welfare today, um, so my role, well, first of all, just to, I'm, good, I'm trying to set the stage, and, and then Angelina's going to bring it to Nova Scotia, and then Cindy's going to close it, because she does that very well. Uh, but let's start, so I'm just going to sort of set the table for you, and then explain how, why we are where we are in some respects. So this is not even a full timeline. I've started with where, you know, a lot of what we're going to be talking about is the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal's decision in Caring Society. Um, which was started by the Caring Society, and Cindy was the executive rec director of the Caring Society in 2007. Um, and this is events just from that date. Now, Cindy can, and if you've read the article that you were assigned to read too, tell you that a heck of a lot of things happened before that as well that we could add to this, but the PowerPoint slide is only so big. <laughs> so we started in 2007, and I guess my point with this is to show you that, you know, it's been... Uh, that was a successful decision, but it's been a long road. So you'll see that the Caring Society case, at one point the federal government tried um, and almost was successful in having it completely dismissed. And we, that, uh, the Caring Society had to go to the federal court in 2011, and then it got upheld, uh, um, or the dismissal of it got overturned, and then that got up, uh, upheld at the federal court. But a lot to get to the place uh, where, we, uh, where we find ourselves. What else do we have going on? We have the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report that has issued as part of its calls to action. The first five, they, they deem child welfare to be among the most important issue, and so the first five calls were about child welfare. And if I can skip forward a bit and take you to number 13 on that list, those of you who can see it, um, the, uh, this July, the MMIW uh, Commission um, National Qu Inquiry actually put out various recommendations. They have 15 recommendations on child welfare. Um, and so in between that, you can see that um, at number three, we've got the human rights decision, the, the main decision from the tribunal uh, that came out and found that Canada had knowingly been discriminating for o well over a decade with respect to um, Indigenous children. And then Canada didn't appeal that decision. In fact, it said it was going to abide by that decision. But if you look on this list, you'll see I've got eight, I think, additional orders from the CHRT. So Cindy and the, and the Caring Society have been back before the commission numerous times. Um, and at various points, the, the tribunal had to issue what are called non-compliance orders because Canada wasn't complying with the decision, even though it said it was going to. And so at various points, Canada had to be pushed and prodded to do this. Um, and so in between, we, we do have moments where Canada seems to be saying, okay, we're going to take this seriously. So it, you see at number nine, finally in January 2018, after a decision from the tribunal basically saying, you know, our first decision wasn't, man or wasn't a voluntary thing. You actually have to follow it. It is a legal requirement for you to follow. After that, Canada says it's going to take things seriously. 
and it, it unveils a six-point plan to move things forward. There are still decisions that go to the tribunal. Um, in uh, this, this uh, summer, the government um, passed a piece of legislation. I don't think we're going to have too much time to talk about it, but Canada is sort of acting as if th it is the be-all and end-all and end all of its response. It is a piece of legislation that is interesting um, and tries to do some good things, but is, on the other hand, quite deeply flawed. It, it appears to give um, jurisdiction to, to First Nations to pass their own laws with respect to child welfare, and in the meantime also sets a number of minimum standards with respect to um, uh, how provincial laws uh, ha have to actually now follow sort of national standards when it comes to child welfare and Indigenous children. But at the same time, this bill sets out nothing to do with really funding and, very, and sets out few accountability requirements for the government, which is sort of, you know, in the face of this long history, and I'm trying to cover this briefly, um, that is a big part of the problem is funding and lack of accountability by Canada, and that's still a problem. And the last thing I'll talk about, and I know Cindy's going to talk about it more, but setting this up, there was a decision this past September from the Human Rights Tribunal on part of the remedy, which was about a request for um, uh, co uh, uh, compensation for the children and families that have been harmed by ongoing discrimination for well over a decade by Canada. And the tribunal ordered the maximum amount that it's allowed to under the legislation, which is $40,000, to be issued to each child who has been harmed and their families. And very good decision, uh, very well reasoned. Um, however, Canada has recently said that it is uh, going to be judicially reviewing it, which means it's going to seek to appeal it. Um, anyway, we can talk. I know Cindy will speak more about that, but I am sort of setting the table for what the current picture in this very complicated um, issue looks like. So, to take a bit of a step back, what I'm going to now focus on is how we are here. What uh, and so my uh, focus as a legal scholar, uh, I like to look at structures, right? And how legal structures work and how legal structures contribute to the problems. So if you're trying to analyze a problem, is it simply lack of political will? It's part of it, but there's also a structure that's in place that has allowed a lot of this discrimination to happen. So if you, look, if you read my work, you'll see that there's basically three things, and I only have three more slides, these three slides, that look at uh, these three problems that I see are really a big part of why we have the issues that we do with uh, First Nations child welfare. And in fact, these three problems are actually the same problems that uh, afflict um, other social service areas that relate to First Nations in, in, um, on reserve. So we could be talking about drinking water. We could be talking about housing. We could also be talking about social assistance. These three problems uh, apply across the board. So the three problems are, and so I'll just give you a brief history of all of them. Oh, and I'll pause to say this structure is, looks very different than the structure um, that exists elsewhere. So in the provinces, if we're talking about child welfare, uh, the government, the, the provincial government has laws with respect to how child welfare will work. They fund it. Uh, their own civil servants provide those services. Um, but the picture on reserves is really quite different in that it's the federal government who funds it, and you'll see it's not very well. Um, they borrow provincial laws and apply those. Um, and then bans have to administer this, but they actually have no say over either the funding or the rules they have to administer. So it's a very convoluted system that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and the, so the, the three uh, problems with this area, as um, I call them, are one, jurisdictional neglect, provincial comparability, and program devolution. You're going to always see these three issues when you talk about service delivery in First Nations communities, including in child welfare. But the long and short of it is, um, is that basically in the 50s, uh, the Canadian government uh, kind of was faced with the issue of what to do with the mass poverty in First Nations. Post-World War II, this is when the Canadian social safety net gets started being built, and we have programs like social assistance and child welfare. Um, but neither the provinces or the federal government actually really wanted to be responsible for First Nations, and this is a problem we continue to see. Um, and a bunch of things happen, and I'm not going to go into the details of it, but the long story short is that the feds tried to give it off to the provincial government. The provincial government's pushed back 
uh, for the most part and said, no, we're not doing it. And so Canada, instead of saying, okay, I'm going to pass legislation and make real policy and do this, said, well, we'll do something, but just not that much. So what they do instead is they uh, pass this Treasury Board Authority in 1964. So this is, I'm into the second category, provincial responsibility or provincial comparability. And they get funding from Treasury Board, they get authority from Treasury Board to use what are provincial standards, apply provincial standards, and take those standards and apply them on reserve. Um, and essentially that's what they've done since 1964. It's the authority to be able to pay for services um, so long as they are following uh, provincial uh, standards. So they're borrowing provincial standards. And then in the 80s and 90s, after uh, First Nations were really pushing um, the government to do more or, or to actually do more to recognize Aboriginal claims for self-determination and self-government, we have the government uh, entering into contracts with First Nations so they could deliver these services themselves as opposed to uh, the federal government um, give, uh, uh, doing, uh, off offering these services or provincial civil servants delivering these services themselves. Um, so we get this pretty convoluted system. And so I'm just going to spend with my last two minutes and a half um, really just unpacking why this is problematic. Uh, in my paper, you know, I go on to say how I think the case that Cindy has brought and was successful that actually helps us start to dismantle some of these problems. I won't have a chance to really touch on it a lot, but let me walk through why I think that this whole system is so harmful. Um, one of the main issues when we come back to this idea of jurisdictional neglect. So the feds took control, but not really. They didn't pass law and they are just adopting provincial standards instead. So really, nobody is actually exercising thoughtful policy-making decision-making. The Fed say, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll spend money, but we're just going to borrow what the provinces are doing. But the provinces who don't feel that they have jurisdiction for the most part over First Nations are not going out generally and asking First Nations, well, what is good First Nations policy? How is it different on reserve? What are our First Nations worldviews? They're not asking those questions. They're just thinking about their own citizens and not actually developing policy. So this, this strange system actually you know, results in a situation where nobody is really thinking about policy with respect to First Nations. And remember, the First Nations in this system don't really have a choice. Um, the government dictates that they have to follow provincial rules, and uh, the funding agreements that the bands are bound to um, require them to follow those rules. Um, so there's all kinds of issues with this that I go into, but the fact that there is no law makes this very difficult, this area very difficult to challenge, um, and it's very uh, difficult to uh, bring these issues to court. The first, the first case, although this has been this, this has been problematic for decades, it really is Cindy's case, the first time to actually bring some of these issues to court. A uh, few last points that I'm going to make on this, because um, I can't go into everything. Um, is this idea of borrowing rules from the province is highly problematic and is proven to be highly problematic in the context of child welfare. Because indigenous people have different ways of raising their children. Um, they have different, you know, different worldviews about how children are to be taken care of. We don't have this sense of a nuclear family. We have la large families and kinship relationships and you have aunties and uncles and grandparents and other people who are taking care of children. But the provincial child welfare system is really much based on a nuclear family. Other issues that the provincial government, um, you know, the rules that are passed for child welfare are really not responsive to even, uh, you know, the impacts of colonialism and how poverty uh, uh, affects First Nations. So you've got policy that is imposed on First Nations that really is not uh, at all responsive to their needs. And this whole system has actually resulted in a situation where um, the government has been able to underfund services for well over, for, for, for decade um, without very little oversight um, and anyone holding them to account. So it's a very problematic system. I could talk about it much longer, but I want to give some room and time for my friends to talk about their issues. But I hope this gives you a little bit of a sense of how the, the structure of how social assist, uh, how about child welfare and other areas of central services really is problematic <laughs> and, and builds into this whole uh, problem that we have today and why we have the discrimination happening in First Nations communities. Thank you. So 
So next, I'm going to introduce uh, my colleague, Angelina Amaral. And maybe I'll just go back to here while she does that. Perfect. I don't have a PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> but school, just handwritten on paper. <laughs> so um, Angelina um, has a BA, what, um, BA in medicine? Med, med? No, what is med? Psych? No, that's my master's. Master's, so okay. Masters, an LLL, and a JD. And she's a Mi'kmaq lawyer and a member of the uh, Miabukek, um, it's uh, First Nation, that's Con River in Newfoundland. Um, she has been involved in drafting a number of community-based protocols specific to the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia, uh, including the Building a Bridge Protocol for the use of Section 84 of the Corrections and Conditional Release Act, the Mi'kmaq inclusion in the process of accountability for hunting and fishing offenses protocol for addressing regulatory offenses in the Cape Breton Highlands, and the Mi'kmaq sentencing protocol, uh, the Mi'kmaq custom adoption protocol, and uh, yeah, I'm not going to try to pronounce all those, but yes, she's been involved in a lot of great governance stuff. Take it away. All right. All right. Thank you very much, Naomi. Oh, and thank you. So as Naomi mentioned, my name is Angelina. I am an ill-new lawyer and my home is Con River in Newfoundland. So I'm currently living away from home and have been for a really long time here up in Nova Scotia, but I still feel at home because I have only ever worked with and for our Mi'kmaq and ill-new communities. So right now, I do work for the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq Chiefs. And before I get into um, really more of what we've been doing around child welfare, just to let you guys know what the Assembly is. So the Assembly of Nova Scotia Mi'kmaq Chiefs is where all 13 Mi'kmaq Chiefs of Nova Scotia and Nova Scotia is entirely Mi'kmaq territory, along with our Grand Chief and three other members of the Grand Council and our AFN Regional Chief, come together to discuss areas of Mi'kmaq rights, title, and common policy concerns. And this is where we come together and child welfare is just one of those areas that we are coming together to discuss and to build for our nation. So when it comes to child welfare, the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia have actually been engaged in child welfare reform since the early 1980s, on their own as the communities. These first movements led to the creation of Mi'kmaq Children and Family Services of Nova Scotia. At that time, the only one of its kind, and probably still today, the only one of its kind, where it, this is a fully delegated service agency, that provides the full range of child welfare services from investigation, right to adoption, and everything in between at a provincial level. We are the only one in Canada that has that. So this was the first movements, and this is one of the things they were able to build back in 1985. And as Naomi touched, the way we were able to get this is through a tripartite agreement. Within that agreement, we did have to follow all provincial rules, policy standards. Guess what? Over the many years that uh, the agency has been around, it has not worked. It doesn't work, hasn't worked, and now we have to completely reform the whole system because it is to the point where we can no longer allow the system to happen. That's where it is. So in 2015, after Cindy's case, we uh, came together and the assembly became involved in child welfare with our Mi'kmaq Family and Children's Service Agency together and we established two goals at that time. The first was to establish complete jurisdiction and governance over child welfare within Nova Scotia, where decision making and pro processes reflect our principles, values, customs, practices, traditions, where it looked like us, where we could be a part of it. It was home for us. And the second one was, you know what? We're not there yet, but we're st we still have the provincial system that we have to go by. In order to keep our agency, we have to maintain the tripartite agreement. A part of that agreement, we have to follow provincial laws and policy standards, all that goodness. So in the interim, we agreed to work with the province and Mi'kmaq Family and Children's Services, our agency that has built capacity over the many years that it has been in functioning. Uh, to identify what were the gaps in the current system and to make recommendations on what could be done. So within that process, interim process, we did make over 25 amendments to the Children and Family Services Act and there is a whole new section within the child welfare policy that completely deals, solely deals with cultural competence. There's another section that deals with when you're working with specifically with Mi'kmaq people. There is now a requirement to follow the seven sacred teachings and to be more culturally appropriate and relevant. So those were some of the things we were able to do, and that was back in 
2017. Seems like a long time ago, but it wasn't. <laughs> um, so that's what we were able to do there. So now, right now, the, uh, the assembly and then along with the communities, we are in the process of lawmaking and policy making in the area of child welfare. And in order to do this, we always have to remember that we're working within a collective. It's not individual rights based. No one person can go off, make all the decisions and come back and say this is how it's done. We have to do it together. And this is where inclusion becomes important for us. So as we engage in this process, the assembly has already engaged our Mi'kmaq communities in a number of different ways. We've held two symposiums where we invite everyone across, well from our communities, right across to uh, inform the work that we're doing. And we're actually going to be hosting our third one this November coming up. We've held many focus groups, specific areas. We've had focus groups with our Mi'kmaq law students, our Mi'kmaq lawyers, our elders, right across the board. We've also gone into every community and held an open community session where everyone was welcome to come if they wanted to hear. We've met with every chief and council. So these are the accountability things that we have to do when we work in a collective. We always have to engage and we always have to include. And then of course, we always go back to the assembly, our 13 chiefs and our grand council to see this is what we found and get our direction. So through that process and all of that, what did we hear? So this is what we heard from, uh, in relation to our Mi'kmaq children and youth. And I wanted to share this part with you. So what we heard is that our Mi'kmaq children and youth are the greatest gifts that we are given from the creator. They are our most valuable resource. They are deserving of the widest range of services and entitled to rights which includes the right to live in their homes and their community. They are our future, our leaders, and the carriers of our nation. And they are the true victims of the child welfare system. So with that, and through that process, we also began to identify priorities for our people, for the nation within Nova Scotia. The first was to further develop our program, Wigamanej Gigamana. So that is our family group circles program and we have done that. That runs according to a Mi'kmaq protocol. So it's at a provincial territory and it can only be changed by Mi'kmaq Family Children's Services. And that program is fully staffed now and it's continuing to expand and build out more and apply in other areas and not just limited ones where we see it fitting. Um, the other area was foster care and assessments. The three years I worked on child welfare, foster care was in crisis. I believe it was in crisis 10 years before I got there and is still in crisis. So that's a whole problem. Assessments was another thing. Assessments, uh, they're not culturally appropriate and they actually become barriers for our people in order to be able to do anything. Another area of focus was customary care and custom adoption, both now recognized within provincial law, but it is also for us to determine what that custom is and how it's to be done. So we are currently uh, dividing mechanisms and processes for that. That's going to allow us to respectfully engage our communities in these uh, processes for child welfare, for our Mi'kmaq Family and Children's Services. Another area was uh, Mi'kmaq Facilities and Family Resource Centers. So group homes, uh, safe homes, all those. And the Family Resource Centers, you can see almost every block, zero within any of our communities. We have no facilities for our Mi'kmaq youth. We have no family resource centers in any of our communities within Nova Scotia. So that was another area that we needed to build upon. And the final area that we wanted to really uh, reach out on was uh, youth, youth engagement and youth outreach. And our youth uh, outreach coordinator is actually sitting here very happy looking, Madison Joe. Hey, there's a smile. <laughs> so he is currently working with us because one of the things we noticed that as we were going through the process, there was only one community session where there were youth in the room. And that really changed the dynamic and how you spoke about things. And then we started thinking, do the youth even know what their rights are under this law? We make decisions for them, we talk about them, but what do they want? So a part of that and as we build our system is, uh, you know, what do the youth want as we continue to rebuild our system for them? This really is for them. So last year we did begin our ill new uh, legislation and policy development process, so we are in it now. And, uh, you know, and then we have to start thinking about the environment we l we're working in. As Naomi mentioned, uh, well maybe not here, at a different thing we were at. <laughs> Didn't happen here. It happened last week at another thing. Um, so it's a short presentation, okay? <laughs> the Maritimes was first contact. Over 500 years, colonialism, discriminatory policies, all of it. Over 500 years. So when we sat down to do it, first question, what are those Mi'kmaq principles and values? 
right? I have some ideas, but we have to share those. So what's our shared understanding of that? Second question, where do we find them? It's not gonna be written down. We're going through, that was it, stories. So where are we gonna find all those things? And then once we find them where we think we found something, how do we know that's it, right? So now we have to go through and find, this is policy and law development within our communities. So we have to go through and find all that. Then when you're working within this environment, you wanna build these policies and laws, then you gotta think about what else has been lost. Trust Bet among governments, our Mi'kmaq government, between the federal government, provincial governments. The other thing that's been lost is also trust among ourselves because we've been fighting for so long, as Naomi mentioned, for limited to no resources with no say. So that's another thing we have to work on. So and then when you look at it, resources. Where do all the human resources come from to build this system? And the Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia are doing it on a provincial wide scale. All right, we're not doing one community. It's the whole province. So when you look at human resources and financial resources to do that, what do you need? I heard the federal government has about 400 lawyers that work for them. <laughs> provincial government, because we are working on a provincial scale. Provincial government, I'm pretty sure, has a legal department with both barristers and solicitors, those who argue in court and those who do the research. The Mi'kmaq of Nova Scotia under the assembly, I was like trying to figure out who all the lawyers in there. I got 10, <laughs> all right? I'm gonna push it and say 20. We can have about 20 all because we do pull in people from everywhere, but that's it. And that's what we're using to build a system and deal with federal and provincial governments. So when you're talking about resourcing, how does it happen? But, you know, we're always working at a deficit without enough. That's just the way it is. That's fine, we will keep going. You know, the issues are complex and they're deeply rooted, internally and externally. So why do we keep doing this? We know we're gonna burn out, right? If you hear that, there's no other thing to happen. So why do we keep going? Because as we heard, children are our greatest gifts from their creator. And it is our collective responsibility to care for the ill new children of our nation. That's why we keep going. And as long as we keep taking steps, no matter how big or how small they may seem, we keep going forward. So that's why we keep doing it. So, thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Angelina. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Cindy Blackstock, um, who is a tireless advocate. She is the executive director of the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society, as was mentioned, and she's also a professor in the School of Sh Social Work at McGill. She is a member of the Gitson First Nation and has 25 years of social work experience in child protection and Indigenous children's rights. Uh, her promotion of culturally based and evidence informed solutions has been recognized by the Nobel Women's Initiative, the Aboriginal Achievement Foundation, and the Frontline Defenders, and many others. And I'll just quick, a quick one, a uh, little story. The other day on Twitter, I saw somebody post something that Cindy should get a, a Nobel Peace Prize for all of her work and retweet if you agree. And, I, and my response is if I could retweet, retweet this a thousand times, I would, because your work is just phenomenal and ongoing. I'm, I, I, I think you probably look forward to the day that you retire, but it's, uh, it doesn't seem that it's going to be anytime soon, and we thank you for your work. Anyway, you're welcome. So it's election season right now. How many of you are going to vote? I'm here to tell you how to vote. Yay. You can exhale now. I'm not here to tell you to vote for a party. I'm here to tell you to vote for an idea. I'm actually here to tell you to vote for a fundamental human principle in a country that has always failed to achieve it for First Nations kids. And that is that racial discrimination in the provision of public services towards children in particular should be something that every person in this society rejects. And any party that quibbles about it says that we need to be patient, that it's gonna take time, or here's the big one, it's complex, <laughs> should not get our vote.
If the government of Canada can negotiate a trade agreement with that nutcase in the White House, <laughs> they could end inequality for First Nations children and their families. And they've already achieved it. They have already achieved it for every other child in this country. Think about that. So why is it that for them, racial discrimination is easier than treating children with equity? You know, um, I began my career, I guess, if you'll call it that way, was working in group homes and seeing uh, First Nations kids uh, filling most of the rooms. And back then, in the early 1980s, um, there wasn't a lot of talk about why that was. It just was normal. And I'm not here to tell you that no First Nations children should be in child welfare care because some of them should. What I'm here to tell you is that when there's overrepresentation in child welfare, it's not really the child welfare system that's the problem. Child welfare is a symptom of the cross-cutting inequalities that First Nations children and their families continue to endure and the repetitive wave of injustice perpetrated by the federal government from everything from colonialism to residential schools and on down. That's the problem we need to focus on. And that's my worry that we've been too short-sighted in this whole debate. Because the leading reason, and I, I'm not using the word indigenous intentionally, by the way. I don't like that word at all, frankly. We'll talk about that offline. But um, First Nations children are 12 times more likely to be in the child welfare system than other kids because of poverty, poor housing, caregiver substance misuse related to mental health from trauma from residential schools, and all of this is aggravated by the fact that the federal government has known since 1907 that it underfunds these services and that those services are linked to the deaths and the poor health outcomes for children. Now that's important for you to know. This is not being done because they don't know about the problem. They know they're underfunded. They agree with that. They have solutions to remedy the problem. They're choosing not to do it, and they're getting away with it because we, the public, don't vote for equality at every election. We focus on other things. Now, just last week, I was in Washington, D.C., um, and uh, we were releasing a report from the Pan American Health Organization on health equity and inequity in the Americas on, that has a particular focus on indigenous people and persons of Afro descent. Because no matter where you travel in the Americas, it's these two populations that are at the top of every list you don't want to be at the top of and the bottom of every list you do want to be at the top of. And um, th th that's not a cultural deficit or a racial deficit. It is a systems deficit that makes those numbers happen. So I, I commend that report to you because we actually, it was chaired by uh, Sir Michael Marmot, some of you may know him, he's a worldwide expert in equity, and we actually include the land as a determinant of health. And it's interesting as a, as a First Nations woman that the environment has finally become popular uh, amongst the non-Indigenous population, but uh, you know, we've known this for a while. And we also use colonialism as an interferer uh, I think that this whole Western determinants of health is a simplistic uh, view of how you actually need to deal with it. Um, who watched the debate last night? Did you hear Trudeau talk about compensation, that he's for compensating the kids that he is wrongly discriminated against in this case? I found that particularly interesting. Um, as Naomi so eloquently pointed out, uh, this case actually has its roots going back at least 20 years. And back then I was very naive. I thought, you just go to Ottawa from Vancouver, first of all. Not exactly something you want to do, is go from Vancouver to Ottawa. But I did. 
And I thought, it's only a short-term sacrifice because clearly we're going to show them how they're discriminating against kids. We're going to work with some of the top economists and some amazing people. And I just really want to give a shout out to Joan Glode from Mi'kmaq Family and Children's Services, who's one of my personal heroes and was the founder of the agency. Um, that we are going to show them how to fix it and they would do it, right? I believe back then that governments were moral and logical. What I've now learned is that they're a sociopath. <laughs> they are neither moral or logical. They are not doing right simply because it's the right moral thing to do or the right evidentiary thing to do. They are doing it because we, the public, demand that it's done. So he says he's willing to pay compensation to these victims of the discrimination, and I want to spend just a quick moment talking about who they are. Because a lot of people in this whole timetable of the case forget the stories about the real kids, and I'm just going to give you a couple. One is a little girl who just before Christmas goes in for dental surgery and something goes horribly wrong. She's in palliative care. She requires a bed to keep her at a 30 degree angle so she doesn't suffocate if she's to go home for the last few weeks of her family's life. The request for the hospital bed goes through 15 different bureaucrats before someone writes on there, absolutely not. The rationale? They don't want to set a precedent. What happens if there's other kids who are terminally ill who need these beds, they ask. That could cost us a lot of money. A doctor with a bigger heart than the government paid for her bed so that she could die in the company of her family. Another family has two children. One has already passed away. The Canadian government, would, uh, the children have both have got a terminal disease. It's left them incontinent. Canada said they'll only authorize up to a certain number of diapers per day. They have to make use of that and only a certain number of feeding tubes. And so the family has to rewash the feeding tubes. One of the children died and the father's on the phone crying, inconsolable, worried that maybe he didn't wash those feeding tubes well enough so his daughter could live. Those are the victims of the discrimination. But the federal government would have you believe that they're the victim <laughs> of all of this that they're the victims of the irrevocable harm if they pay those children the maximum compensation for their discriminatory act. And they also say that they declare for themselves to an act of hubris that they are entitled to decide what is the right way to do this compensation. And to say we need more time because it comes at an inconvenient time in our election. What they don't tell you is that the order for compensation dates back to 2016. We did legal submissions in 2014 where the federal government said it doesn't owe a penny. And then we had another hearing earlier this year, well in advance of the, of the hearing, where Canada says, no, it shouldn't pay anything. This is the wrong forum for it. And at a minimum, the Caring Society and the Assembly of First Nations should have brought the children themselves to testify about the harms that they had undergone, so it could be part of the record. You can't order a individual settlement in a systemic case, argues Canada. So the inhumanity of their position has been chronic and consistent. I turn now quickly to this Bill C-92, which I think is deeply flawed, as Naomi says. A couple of things. Federal government would ask you to believe that you can get jurisdiction and we'll deal with the funding issue later. Remember me and my three-year commitment to come to Ottawa? You have one year under this law to negotiate what they call a collaboration agreement that could include funding. Can you imagine trying to negotiate sufficient funding with Canada within one year? When we have been at that table for over 20, we have 10 legal orders behind us and they're still not complying. And then after that year, your law becomes effective. Isn't that great? But you have no money to operate your child welfare system. 
The other thing is it does nothing about those underlying factors we talked about. If you don't deal with housing, if you don't deal with the inequalities in, in poverty and any of these other items, education, early childhood, then your child welfare system, no matter who it's directed by, will still be overrepresented. And then there's a third piece, is that people think that they can take over the agency funding, and there's a sign there. Okay, thank you. Uh, that, but that's incorrect. The federal government has literally restricted the funding for agencies only for agencies with provincial funding. So if they're for First Nations who think they'll just transfer over that money, that's a non-starter. That's not going to happen. The federal government's already made sure of that. Which brings me to the solution to this thing, which is the Spirit Bear plan. Now, Spirit Bear, the teddy bear, which Naomi knows well, he knows, you know, he is our symbol at the tribunal. And he represents children. And I need to tell you, when we launched this case, we had a program called I Am a Witness, which invited persons like yourself to follow it online and come to the hearings. And almost no one did. The first group to come to the hearings were actually kids. Did you know that children know fairness at the age of two? And unlike all of us, we haven't normalized this discrimination. They don't normalize it. They know it's wrong. There's no excuse for this. So they filled the courtrooms. And when they came into the courtroom, and you imagine yourself as a six-year-old, you have a choice becoming from coming to see me or the bear. Who are you going to go for? <laughs> so the bear has become quite popular. His name is Spirit Bear. And he has a plan. In the 153 years that Indian Affairs has existed, it has never undergone an independent evaluation, 360 evaluation, to determine why it doesn't do better when it knows better. We want that to happen. Second thing, get the parliamentary budget officer to cost out all of the inequalities impacting First Nations children and families and public services. Everything from water to housing to decontamination of lands to uh, children's programs to for spaces for kids to have fun on reserve. We don't even talk about that. Just to, the, the ability for a kid to have fun. We're still at the place of trying to get enough feeding tunes, right? Cost that out and then let's find out how much money that is. And let's create something like a Marshall Plan after the Second World War and eradicate all those inequalities. So far, there's only one political party that's adopted the Spirit Bear Plan. And it's not either one of them that's going to form government. What I want you to do is print off the Spirit Bear Plan and every candidate that comes to your door, you hand it to them and ask them if they're going to support it. And tell them that if they're not going to support it, that means that the default is that they're going to continue this racial discrimination against kids. Now, you might be like me. When I first became aware of this injustice, I knew two things. One is something needed to be done to address it. And number two, that I was absolutely not the right person to do it. I was not smart enough. I didn't know enough. And uh, there was somebody else out there who was going to take this on. And so I waited around a while. I looked left, I looked right, I got a flashlight out, you know? <laughs> the best hero for these kids is each one of you. In fact, their lives depend on you. And they need you to step up and vote for equity. And don't let anybody populate that parliament who continues to think that racial discrimination against kids has any level of excuse. Because if we do, if we vote another way, we're voting away our very humanity. If Trump was doing this, we'd be up in arms. It's happening here. So get out and vote. me to say a couple words after that to sort of wrap up the panel. It's really hard. I'm sitting there thinking, how could I say anything better and on, on, on that note? Um, but he's expecting me to do this, so here goes. Um, so three points sort of come to mind from, from hearing the, 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 the presentations together. I mean, the first thing that stri strikes me is resilience, that, that word. I mean, that, that is what, you know, helps 
uh, I think give many of us, uh, you know, I, I look in resilience, I see other indigenous people showing this amazing resilience and strength and uh, that's what spurs us on. And as uh, Angelina was saying, we do this work, we're under-resourced, we have, we have lack capacity, we're gonna burn out probably, some of us, but we keep doing it because it's gotta be done and there's just no question because we know it's the right thing to do, right? And we'll just keep doing it because that is the right thing. I don't know, Cindy travels all over the country and, and does this tirelessly, right? Because she knows it's the right thing to do. Um, so anyway, uh, it warms my heart to see that. Um, on the other side of it, it's, it, you know, thinking about this, you know, denial that so many Canadians still are, and Cindy, I couldn't have said it better, but this denial that, you know, so many Canadians are in, that they think that Canada is a bastion of human rights, but there are in fact human rights violations going on every day in child welfare, but not just in child welfare. The indigenous poverty that exists today, while it is in part and parcel an effect of the intergenerational effects of residential schools is, be is also because of ongoing policy decisions that continue to be made today by the leaders we elect, right? So that's why it's so important for us to make different decisions. And uh, uh, the last point I'll draw on is that, that normalization, you know, that Cindy said that two-year-olds don't even, you know, we, we have in certain ways in Canada sort of normalized. Those of us who are aware of that discrimination tend to sort of normalize it. And uh, I'll refer to a, uh, an exchange I saw the other day between a, a politician who is running, whose name will name nameless, but he's for a party that probably won't become the leadership. Um, but he was asked a question in announcing uh, funding for drinking water uh, to finally fix drinking water on a reserve. And the, the question uh, to him was, so does that just mean if you were to be elected, you would just write a blank check to First Nations people for their needs? And he said, instead of answering it, turned it back and said, would you be asking me that question if we were talking about Toronto or Montreal? And the, and the, the journalist kind of stuttered and sort of said, well, but it's a lot of money. <laughs> and, the, and the leader persisted and said, okay, what if we're talking about Vancouver and, uh, and Calgary? You know, so, um, but the, the question and that, uh, you know, from a major uh, um, uh, news source, uh, 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 network, was able, you know, that, that, that idea that, but it's a lot of money. We have really normalized it. And so we really need to get past that and to, and to see what's right and, and to do what's right. So uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'm going to close the panel for the question period. I would. <laughs> okay, so we will go to our uh, questions uh, as we normally do. We'll start with uh, student questions, uh, but I'll just a uh, quick reminder to everybody about uh, what our expectations are. We'll start with our students who signed up to ask a question this week, and then we'll go to community questions. And we just ask that you ask your question of one person in particular. So the panelists always have the option to answer whatever they want, but if we can just ask you to direct your question to one person in particular so that um, you're not asking three questions every time. Effectively, you just throw it out to the whole panel. Okay. Can I make one point? I'm Finally, I was supposed to do ahead. this. Um, sure. It's just to say that uh, you know, in in your questions, uh, sometimes it arises on panels like this that people have had their own individual experiences and want to ask about individual cases. We cannot respond to those. Right. Um, However, it, you know, at the end, towards the end, uh, later, uh, when we're sort of packing up, if you do have an individual case, there are some lawyers I might be able to connect you with. So if that is the case, but we cannot answer those directly. It's always good to know a lawyer. Let's, uh, <laughs> we'll start here, please. Sure, so hi, my name's Emma. Um, so first off, I'd just like to thank you all for your informative presentations um, and for being such strong advocates for the issue at hand. So my question's for Cindy. Um, <clears throat> the current state of Indigenous child welfare has been compared to the past residential school system. So should the Indigenous child welfare system improve, how can we be certain or are there any supervisory mechanisms that can be implemented so that we know that government does not resort back to similar discriminatory and assimilative practices should they implement um, a good system in the future? That's a good question. Uh, that's one that the tribunal is actually tied up with right now because uh, it has to prevent the recurrence of discrimination. We say that that's invested in the Spirit Bear Plan and we would like to see the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's uh, uh, recommendation that there actually be a panel to monitor all the TRC's calls to action, that that actually be put in place and that has teeth. Um, otherwise, what we're going to do, uh, certainly I can say this publicly, and I've sold, told it to them as well, 
is we're getting pretty good at litigation. <laughs> and uh, if necessary, we will continue to litigate against Canada because the one thing that absolutely isn't going to stand is their ongoing racial discrimination towards our kids. And uh, so they are going to get watched whether they like it or not. So they should, uh, you know, they should just cave in and give up and do the right thing. That's my thing. And we're also training bureaucrats, by the way. Um, and one of the things that I found in the record that was so consistent that needs to be disrupted is that in the federal public service, there's a real tendency to defend the government. So no matter where the critique is coming through, no matter how valid it is from the Auditor General or from uh, the uh, Canadian Medical Association uh, or from First Nations, the reflex is to defend. No one even thinks about whether the critique is legitimate or not. And I found in my review, I, I personally had, I won't say the pleasure, but I'll say the opportunity to read 80,000 unredacted documents on First Nations child welfare produced by the feds. And of that, I would say 80% of their time is communications, trying to defend the government. Only about 20% of their time was actually trying to create new policy. Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, my name is Mona, and I would like to first um, say that to thank each of the speakers for your incredibly enlightening and truly powerful presentations. So my question is for Naomi Metallic. Um, so looking at the history between Indigenous communities and the Canadian government illustrates a very strong example of paternalistic governance, um, where both federal and provincial government has almost dictated what was and is best for Indigenous communities. Many of the current federal leaders during yesterday's debate claim they will work with Indigenous communities. Um, however, one leader brought up that a really good point, essentially stating that working with communities does not mean that we need to sit down and talk to them until we convince them of um, Western values. Um, therefore, exercising coercive power. Uh, you have mentioned in your work uh, that self-governance self-governance is the key to improving indigenous people's living conditions and countering the impacts of colonialism. Therefore, I would, um, therefore, would you suggest that complete autonomy is the path uh, to take to move forward and avoid coercive intervention um, that has in the past ultimately led to assimilation? And if so, I'm curious to know what sort of relationship you envision between Canada and indigenous communities following this model, and if not, what sort of relationship model would you propose? Very interesting question. Um, so I think sometimes, well, we, we are not taught a lot about, you know, uh, indigenous claims for self-determination and self-government. I think we operate often in a, in a vacuum where we don't know what that is, and so we sort of assume it might be the worst case scenario, right? Or what, it, what does it mean? Are they gonna go off and just have their own country? Uh, what, what, what could it possibly mean? We live in a federal uh, country already, right? We have various forms of government who operate in, on various levels and interact with each other, um, and, 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 it, and it works, right? The sky hasn't fallen, and so we have provincial governments, and they have powers, and we have municipal governments. We've had First Nations governments that have very limited powers, but we have First Nations governments. So. Um, when we're having the discussion of what is self-government, um, you know, it, it can exist in a variety of forms, and not and it's not going to necessarily be one model for you know one uh, for all uh, First Nations or Inuit or Métis people. It may have different models, but what it really is about at its core is Indigenous people being able to make decisions that are really important to their life, and ha you know, and, and and to be able to control their destiny, which has been large been largely controlled by other governments, as you pointed out. Right? And so uh, that can take different forms and it may not happen overnight, but it needs to happen. And, and really in key areas where failure to do so is, is, is resulting in so much harm in children going into these systems and then as children aging out of that and ending up in the criminal justice system and we're overrepresented in both. And there's been lots of studies that have said that if you give the control back, because indigenous people know a lot about what, uh, what are the right decisions for their people, then you will see those numbers go down and changes happen. And we've seen it in the U.S. We don't often like actually talk about how the U.S. has recognized far more self-government. Tribes have, I mean, it's not perfect, but they actually introduced legislation to recognize self-government for U.S. tribes in the 70s. 
right? And, and that had a significant, it's not perfect again, but it has had a significant impact on lowering the number of indigenous children in care in the US. So if the sky doesn't fall when it happens, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a nuanced discussion about what it is, but it doesn't necessarily mean separate, separate societies. It means working together, but also allowing indigenous people to control their destiny. One thing I just add to that is I really watch the government's language. Uh, they are ordered under the United, or they, they've adopted, they say, the United <laughs> Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. That says that they have a duty to consult with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. But when you listen to their language, they talk about working with partners. We're not even First Nations, Métis, or Inuit. We're partners. Mm -hmm. They talk about engagement. Well, I'm not interested in being engaged to the federal government, right? Let alone marrying them. <laughs> like, that's not going to happen. Um, they use uh, all talking to, working with. They do everything they possibly can to get away from their duty to consult. So just watch for that. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Lauren, and my question is for Angelina. Um, I think that a contributing factor to this systemic racism is the lack of indigenous representation in federal and provincial governments. For instance, the Minister of Indigenous, indigenous Affairs isn't even indigenous. Um, therefore, should there be quotas on the number of indigenous people in government, or at the very least, a law that ensures that indigenous affairs is ran by someone who is actually indigenous? more indigenous people, especially if you're in places or positions where you're going to be making decisions or working with the, our communities, but not just be indigenous, but if anybody wants to work with our communities in any area, you should have a court. You need to show us that you are competent and skilled in certain areas. So one of the things we are doing outside of, so the assembly is not doing this, but Angelina is with the Barrister Society, the TRC uh, working group, so we have another group that Naomi also sits on that. Um, working with uh, their credentials. So one of the things we are going into and as we move into self-government and self-determination, because that's what it's really about, being able to make decisions for ourselves, is when we start setting up these systems, we will have requirements if you want to work in this system. So if you're a social worker, we would be approaching the credentials for social work. <coughs> Here's a course that any social worker who wants to work with our children needs to have and needs to be able to show they are skilled in that before they can come in and work with us. And we're thinking of doing this in many different fields, medical, law, social work, and whatever else is out there. So that's my answer to that. Please go ahead. I um, just want to say thank you so much um, for being such strong advocates for the causes of um, First Nations children. Um, and this question is for Cindy. In, lit in litigating the case on First Nations child welfare, it came to light that the Department of Indian and Northern Affairs Canada, INAC, whether directly or indirectly, contributed to the despicable, children, despicable treatment of First Nations children in the provision of child welfare services. Do you think any structural problems in INAC is responsible for this? Um, also, you mentioned that a lot of reform is needed in INAC. Can you talk about some of these reforms? Thank you for your question. Absolutely, I think the it's, uh, INAC needs to be reformed and it's responsible. Um, it's important that we kind of, let's just stay with this language for a minute from the tribunal's most recent decision. Canada was, is, notice the tense there, is willfully and recklessly discriminating against First Nations children. Not past tense, is, and children. When Minister O'Regan came out and uh, about the appeal, they, were, they quickly assembled a news conference and pushed him in front of the camera. And uh, he talked about, oh, well, this is, you know, we believe the survivors need compensation. Well, for two things about that. One is the survivors are in some cases five years old. Number two, some of those kids have not just survived. And the tribunal has specifically made a finding that Canada's non-compliance to this order since 2016 is linked to the deaths of children. I don't know if many of you watched the Aboriginal People's Television Network uh, recent report about Ontario alone, and what they have seen is that 102 First Nations kids died in the first two years while we're trying to bring Canada under compliance. 
You know what's interesting is when I hear the politicians speak or even the bureaucrats speak, is I don't get that sense that they own that. They can understand that. I remember when the decision first came down, they sent over a deputy minister to see me. It was the first time I talked to the government since we filed it, right? Uh, with one exception. But I asked them a question. I said, tell me, how did it feel when you heard the decision that you're racially discriminating against little kids? And how did that change the way that you think and the way that you act in the department? And the only answer she could give me is that's an interesting question. <laughs> if you were to ask that of Trudeau today, I think he'd give you the same answer. They would talk about their record. They immediately go to try and make themselves out to be the good guys, right? Um, and I'm not saying that they're evil people. What I am saying is that willful and reckless racial discrimination against children is done by people who consider themselves good and don't have the courage to understand and take responsibility for their collective conduct. That's the, that's the danger of it, is that we can all become complicit in the banality of evil. And it gets that way because it's normalized. And you think of yourself as a good person. So how can you say I'm racially discriminating? Because in order for them to reform the department, they have to accept responsibility for that, and they've not done it. They talk about fixing the child welfare system. Well, the keynote of the tribunal's decisions is that they're the ones that need to be fixed. That's why the Spirit Bear Plan is so critical. Among the reforms I'd like to see is, number one, they need to hire competent staff. For years, they talked about capacity building and First Nations child welfare, about our credentials. Well, I could teach every single one of them in the Department of Indian Affairs. Uh, none of the people that they had drafting that Bill C-92 had any degrees regarding children. None of them had ever worked with children. And yet they were overruling our suggestions that were coming forward from First Nations experts in children, child welfare. Uh, they said, it, that's not the way it's done, right? And that's easy to do if you have no training in the area. The other thing they do for the training issue is when we looked at, after the, uh, through access to information, the federal government was saying, no, you, don't, you can't make any orders against us on training because it's, we're the employer. We'll take responsibility for that. Trust us. But I don't trust them. So I filed an access to information request. And what I found is, and this is as of 2017, 18, somewhere in there, the only tra mandatory training for Indi Indian Affairs employees was an up to one hour online seminar on elders. And so I got the materials on that. And for the First Nations folks, they had the medicine wheel and the feather. Now I am from a BC First Nation. We do not smudge, we never saw the medicine wheel and there aren't, a, we, feathers are not really in our thing, right? But that's how, that was the only training that's required. So that tells you how much importance they really put to our kids, right? That's after the TRC. There's no mandatory training on the TRC. And one of the things that I found most disturbing about Canada is that who knows remembers Michael Wernick from the SNC level. And while his previous history was as Minister of Indian Affairs during the time we were litigating this case, what, uh, Jordan's principle, which is the idea that First Nations kids should get access to services when they need them, was passed through the House of Commons in 2007. All those cases I talked about earlier, those happened in the intervening years. Canada's official position was there was no Jordan's principle cases. In 2012, Michael Wernick gave the highest award in the public service to the team that was denying the children under uh, Jordan's principle. So racism in Indian affairs was not only normalized, it was, it was award-winning. And that's what's incentivized. We want the Spirit Bear Plan to unfold those ways of thinking and doing and create a different incentive uh, program that really incentivizes compliance with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, com uh, compliance with the TRC, compliance with the tribunal's decision. And that those decisions are not made by the government itself, because the government always says it's doing enough, that that be done in an independent way through a 360 evaluation. And some people may not be, know that deputy ministers actually get financial bonuses every year. 
Um, I think those bonuses uh, should not be awarded by the government. They should be awarded by an independent panel of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples to see if those folks are deserving of it. So those are a couple ideas. <laughs> okay, thanks so much. Um, we're going to open it up to community questions now. So you can just signal with your hand and uh, wait for Tari. And if I may just ask that you uh, direct your, right here, thanks, uh, direct your question to one person in particular, that would be super, just so we can maximize question time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, this question's uh, for Cindy Blackstock. Um, I'm actually a U.S. Can uh, Canada dual citizen, so I wanted to ask you a kind of a perspective question on how each nation uh, handles mm -hmm. reconciliation. Uh, where I was living, I was living in South Florida, right near the Seminole Nation. Mm -hmm in South Florida, uh, and as a dual citizen, I've lived in both countries, I recognize that while both nations are have a certain level of complacency regarding reconciliation, their, their approaches are very different, so I wanted to ask you um, how you would characterize the differences in approaches in the U.S. and Canada towards reconciliation. Yeah, it's a good question. Well, you know, uh, I think Naomi's point is really well taken. You can go down into the U.S. and, for example, there's tribal courts in the U.S., right, and that all flows from that that very important work that uh, Native American, Alaska Native, and Hawaiian Native tribes did together in the 50s and 60s and much before that. What is very similar, and we found this on that Pan American Health Organization study, is a consistent underfunding. So the Bureau of Indian Affairs funds uh, federally funded services on reservations in the United States. We use reservations in the US, we use reserves in Canada. What they found, for example, on um, healthcare funding, the federal government in the U.S. funds other constituencies for health care. They fund veterans, they fund federally incarcerated prisoners, for example, and they fund members of Congress. Um, federally incarcerated prisoners were getting double the amount of health care funding than Native Americans. And that is, uh, uh, that is as of 2017. The other thing that gets buried in the U.S. is there's hardly all, any discourse on the rights of N Native American and Alaskan Natives. And this comes up in a variety of forays. So like, for example, I'm just going to take the police shootings, right? So it's true that African Americans in the United States are far more likely to be shot fatally by police. But it's actually Native Americans who are at the top of the list. And there is no dialogue about that at all in the conversation. It's not to diminish what's happening in, with black Americans, but it is to say that why aren't we having the conversation about Native Americans in the United States? In the US Declaration of Independence, there is something called Article Two, and it says, includes the phrase, the merciless Indian savages, right in the birth certificate of the United States. That tells you how deep the savage and civilized dichotomy is baked into the US DNA. And Justice Ginsburg, who is the most progressive member on the Supreme Court, uh, she actually cited the doctrine of discovery in a recent land decision against Native American tribes. And the doctrine of discovery is basically that uh, Indians are savages, therefore they cannot own land. And the only people who really can own land are Christian folks, not even just any other religion. If you're off any other religion, you're white and Christian. And so that is how kind of pervasive the racism is in the United States. And then, of course, that you have the nutcase in the United States, in the White House, on top of that, right, with this Pocahontas kind of craziness uh, on top of there. So the racism is, is manifested very similarly through these two countries. Uh, there's just not as much attention to it in the United States, right? And uh, I think that there's a lot of work to be done there because there are so many good progressive Americans, and thank God for those people speaking up, especially during these dark, difficult times, uh, but much more needs to be done. And I think universities are a horrible fault for that because they really don't have very many courses at all. Places like Harvard that actually were Native American schools when they were founded are just, uh, you know, in the last 20 years, starting to bake in Native American centers and Native American courses. Cindy, I want to just pick you up on a question about uh, the role of, of public administration. There are a number of public administration students, and we were discussing earlier the lack of courage yeah. in the system. And so I wanted to ask you, how do we teach courage in public administration? Yeah. Uh, has anyone heard of moral courage? <coughs> 
There's a great Moral Courage YouTube channel. I want you to check it out. So basically what it is is that we, we have pub, uh, person, students in public service or lawyers or in my case social workers and we expect them to be advocates but we assume they're courageous and most of us aren't. Particularly in my field of social work, a lot of us are pretty gutless, right? We're supposed to be about social justice but if you really ask the question, when, not many movements in Canada have been led by social workers, right? So then the question becomes why? And um, moral courage uh, really embraces the fact that in Western society, we actually reward physical courage. So if I was to find, go you know, drive by the Atlantic, I see someone drowning, I save them, even if I'm some kind of person with a horrible moral record, I'll be on the front page of the newspaper with the mayor and a medal around my neck in no time. But we actually punish moral courage. Moral courage is the ability and willingness to speak out about something that's wrong and being willing to take a personal or professional hit for doing it. And we call those people whistleblowers, like that, three cheers for the, whoever that person is who's <laughs> taken down Trump. I mean, that is, that's guts on a, on a big level. Um, and uh, we call them rocking the boat, uh, that you're disloyal, right? So that loyalty in the public service can be really warped. I think that we have to practice moral courage and um, we need to do it every day in our lived lives in order to prepare for the big moment when it comes. Like for us, we were had great advice from an elder. He said, never fall in love with the caring society, never fall in love with your business card, only fall in love with the children because there may come a day when you have to sacrifice both those things for them. And we, when we filed the case, within 30 days, we lost all of our federal funding. We're still today the only First Nations Métis Inuit organization that doesn't get a dime from Canada unless it's owed to us, uh, ordered by the company, <laughs> tribunal to us. So we're completely independent, we can say what we want. Um, but moral courage, there's a YouTube channel, two to three minute vignettes of people of all walks of life who have been morally courageous. And I wanna just spend one other quick moment of your time, I hope I'm on this, is the reason that we're not morally courageous is because it's, we think it's easier on us. Uh, um, I'm gonna run a scenario here. I'm on a bus, which I frequently am, because I hate taxis. So I'm on a bus. <coughs> Some yahoo disturbs my absolute exhaustion at the end of the day to say something ridiculous to someone next to me. I know I should say something. You know that jolt that comes? Yeah, the more kind of, oh God, I got Someone has to do something. I look around and no one is. And I start to think, well, maybe I'll call more attention to it so I'll just be quiet. Or uh, maybe, you know, what if this person gets even more offensive? Then it may have created a problem. So all of this self-talk means I do nothing. How well am I feeling two weeks downstream about myself? Is my stress level gone down because I haven't intervened or up because I didn't intervene? It's gone up because I'm now rehearsing what I should have said, right? Yeah. Uh, and those one-liners come up quick, right? Now let's take the moment again. I actually, despite everything, find myself doing something about that situation on the bus. Let's say I fail, but that other person knows that I cared enough to at least try. How do I feel two weeks down the line? I think that if you're spending a lot of time in your, uh, for self-help and work-life balance, um, that's a sign that you're working in a morally uncourageous situation. Moral courage is about acting in tandem with your values. It is much easier to live your life with moral courage than it is with moral cowardice. So I really recommend, I personally have taken some hits uh, and uh, probably stunted my career in the short term. Uh, but all those people who were kind of moral cowards, um, they don't get invitations from CBC to be on the national news anymore, and I do. And I think that part of it is that you have the moral courage to stand up for something that matters. They may not like you, but you at least have the integrity to stand up for something and be counted. So I really recommend that it's probably one of the most important things that you learn is how to be courageous. And remember that you can be courageous and stupid, I'm not talking about that, like those, you know, like the KKK people are arguably courageous, but they're stupid. Um, 
we're talking about being courageous with honour. We have a question from online. We have uh, thank you. So we have an online question, uh, and this comes from Emma, and it's to Cindy. Uh, Emma says, I work in health and education, doing health promotion work in Nova Scotian schools. What actions should I take in my work and encourage educators to take to take meaningful steps towards reconciliation in classrooms and school communities? I love you and your question. <laughs> um, because I really think the long-term strategy is raising a generation a First Nations, Métis, and Inuit kids who never have to recover from their childhoods and a generation of non-Indigenous children never have to say they're sorry. Where they actually, we don't normalize that sense of fairness they automatically have at, at two in the education system. And the children have taught us a lot, those kids who came into the tribunal have taught us a lot about justice and about how to stand up for it. And we now have a whole series of free learning resources based on Spirit Bear. And Spirit Bear has a couple of books, and one of them tells the story of Jordan's principle, Spirit Bear and Children Make History. And the second one is Fishing for Knowledge, Catching Dreams. And both of them are based on true stories of how children of all diversities have stood up against these inequalities and made a huge difference. One of them at the tribunal and Jordan's principle, the other uh, in honor of the great Shannon Fustachian, who is one of my great heroes in education, First Nations education. We have learning guides and we're working on animated features right now with the great Amanda Strong, so those will be out. Um, on our website, we also have things like coloring sheets. We've got grade uh, school kinds of things. And she should also check out Project of Heart, which is a group of teachers who came together to develop free resources that you can use by in any grade to not only educate the youth about the past, and by that I mean not just the dark chapters of Indi uh, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, I mean, I know I'm a bit biased, but I think we're what makes this country cool. Like if you go into the gift shops, right? <laughs> at the airports, what do you find? Smoked salmon, right? Things with the word Canada on that. That's not a British word or a French word, right? Um, you find things like maple syrup. Hello, that's us. <laughs> like you strip that all away and what you're left with is the RCMP, right? <laughs> so we need to teach kids that, you know, like this is part of the cool part of this country is these different languages and that they know many of these words. Then yes, the injustices, but far more important is to teach them about the contemporary injustices and how they, even as children, can involve their sel themselves in peaceful and respectful ways of addressing that. Thank you. We're running short on time, but we have time for maybe a question or two more if we're efficient. And by the way, Naomi has one of Spirit Bear's relatives that she fell down on the job and did not bring today. <laughs> but you, you do have one of his relatives here, and the relative comes, one of the things we have is a calendar, and every month there's a free activity you could do as an individual or as a group or in your family or whatever to promote the TRC's calls to action. So uh, part of what Naomi has to do is one of those activities every month. So get a hold of her and find out what she's doing in October. Thanks with the bear. I have enough to do, but thank you, I will. <laughs> that was part of the deal. I know, I know. I'll bring you to Ottawa. Okay. Hi there, uh, Debbie Martin, I'm in the Faculty of Health. And uh, I just had a, a question for you. As an Inuk woman, I'm just curious to know uh, how the Human Rights Tribunal addresses Inuit particularly, but also Métis uh, children as well. Are they included in the, in the Human Rights uh, Tribunal um, issue or um, is it sp specifically only First Nations uh, children? Uh, it's one of the reasons I don't like the word indigenous. It's way overused, um, and it really doesn't mark the differences in our situation. The federal government only directly funds First Nations child welfare. Therefore, this case was directed at the federal government, for, primarily for its service delivery off -reserve, uh, on reserve, but in some cases off reserve with our Dean Jordan's principal. Um, the findings all relate to First Nations kids. Where it has had a positive impact for Inuit kids is I got contacted by Inuit families right after the decision. And they are, there's something called First Nations and Inuit Health Branch in the federal government. Now the federal government was implementing Jordan's principle for First Nations, but not for Inuit, even though they were subject to the same regime. 
So we uh, hooked these families up with legal counsel and began to file cases against Canada saying that was racial discrimination because they're subject to the same level of discrimination. Canada has now extended Jordan's principle to uh, Inuk children, Inuit children. So that's good news. Uh, Métis uh, Child and Family Services is totally federal or provincial and territorial jurisdiction. There's no federal funding that goes there. Uh, so we can't make the case right now for Jordan's principle. Uh, or for uh, Child and Family Services decision to apply to that particular population. But I should say the um, Métis National Council hasn't asked for that either. So uh, we leave those decisions to them. If they want our help, we do it. Uh, but that's where we're at with that. They'd have to bring their own action. Here in the panel, we have run out of time, but uh, please join me in thanking our panelists for an outstanding discussion. Thank you.